We've got a great panel lined up of thinking about this idea of driving down health disparities. It, it really gets at the heart of everything we're discussing here, except possibly this trip to the the Aspen um, pound later on for the puppy play date, you know, for the puppies. Just about everything except for the puppy play date is covered by this topic of the disparities. Because really what we're talking about, when we're talking about Ebola, we're talking about disparities in health delivery, in the existing health systems there. When we're talking about cancer, we're usually talking about the, the, the fact that the, the rates of um, you know, access to, to treatments are completely different in different parts of the world. So I'm really looking forward to this, um, this conversation. I'm glad you guys came. I'll quickly run through who we've got here uh, today. This is Peter Drobak. He's with Partners in Health. He runs Partners in Health operations in Rwanda. Uh, he also teaches at the Harvard Medical School and lives in Botswana, just to complicate <laughs> uh, his geographical uh, spread. Uh, then we've got Garth Graham. Uh, Garth is visiting us from Connecticut. I am. Uh, way, <laughs> way off. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to quickly run through, make sure I get this right. You're the president of the Aetna Foundation. Sure. You also teach at the uh, University of Connecticut. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Health and Human Services, and he's written extensively on health disparities. Michael Myers is the head of the Rockefeller Foundation. Again, they've thinking a lot about this issue of health disparities, even proposing uh, the idea of universal health care coverage around the world. Um, Jewel Mullen, she's the commissioner of, of health in the state of Connecticut, um, also has thought a lot about these, these issues. So uh, with no further ado, I want to throw out the idea of what is it that you think is likely to have the most impact in the coming years on this problem of health disparities, either globally or domestically, I mean, is it going to be technology? Is it going to be medical innovation? Is it going to be changing the way we teach at universities so that healthcare workforces are trained differently? Um, if there was sort of one thing, um, what do you think it would be that, that could make the most impact in, in changing the, the great disparities that we're all seeing? Uh, maybe we could start with you, Jewel. So the doctor in me would like to see everybody take a step back and rethink when they hear health disparities and not think about medical care as the first solution to work on because so much of what contributes to people's being healthy or unhealthy is related to the social conditions and so many environmental factors that they are exposed to and sometimes can't get themselves out of. Michael, what, what, what do you think? Well, first, I want to thank you for the battlefield promotion uh, <laughs> that, that I've received in that introduction. I had the Rockefeller Foundation's global health work. Judith Roden is, is our oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but thank you anyway for, for, for that. I, I think a game changer based on work that we've done at the Rockefeller Foundation, and our, our health work is, is global, very little in the United States, so mostly in other countries, is to approach the problem of health disparities from the vantage point of the person. And a lot of the work in this area is done uh, from the health systems perspective, and that's important work and very much needs to be done. But less is, is done from the, the point of view of the individual on the ground in the community who's suffering as a result of those disparities. So looking at it from their lens, looking at them as a, a person who's not only a patient, but a worker, uh, someone who's highly networked in their communities, maybe a leader within the community themselves, and tapping into those vital assets that the individual brings as well as the community and trying to capitalize on those to connect them better with health systems is, I think, a, a way to go, and a way we're looking at it increasingly in our work going forward. Garth, what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, I, I look at this in an interesting way. So from a clinical standpoint, I think about you know, you can't have the solution without having the right diagnosis in terms of what you think the problem, the cause of the problem. And so from my perspective, I think a person's zip code matters more than their genetic code. And when you think about it, where people live really defines a lot of their health outcomes. Um, the Robert Johnson has done some incredible work with Place Matters and some other interesting thing to show that even if you go, you know, a couple lines, I'm sorry, a couple further stops um, up, you know, say the red line, um, whether you're in Massachusetts or in D.C. or any of these other places, you go from communities where people you know, have life expectancies 
in either the 60s or 70s um, to people who live you know, 10, 15, 20 years um, longer. And so when you kind of think about that, what it is is there are people who are living years behind others. And so if you think about this concept that place matters, then you think through, then what's the solution? And so part of the solution is creating this, this culture where people are brought into a system of health where um, it's more than just um, where they live, but they're able to kind of experience healthcare in a different way. And so I really think part of the solution is broadening the discussion beyond just the clinical context, understanding more these concepts of social determinants of health, the players and social determinants of health, and bringing all of those um, issues to bear in the places, um, it is kind of the Jeff Brenner hotspots uh, modalities, where you bring all the issues to bear in the places that need it the most. Peter, what, what about you? What would you throw out there? Well, I think a lot about health disparities, both globally between rich societies and poor societies, and then also, of course, within societies, because disparities exist within societies all over the world, including poor countries like Rwanda. To me, reducing disparities has to start with universal primary health care. Uh, it, you know, no matter where you are, poverty gets into the body and causes disease, and the people who are most likely to get sick are the most likely to not have access to health care. And I think that's true in, in poor urban and rural communities in the U.S., and it's certainly, uh, it, it's certainly true where, where I live and work in, in Rwanda. And, you know, take a poor family in a village without access to health care where the child gets a fever, for example. Uh, the family typically does nothing, maybe they're just a local traditional provider uh, because it's inexpensive. Uh, child doesn't get better, waits a little bit longer, and only when that child becomes obtunded, is sort of semi-comatose and very severely ill, uh, does the family then make the leap to use whatever meager resources they have or sell whatever possessions they have to go and seek medical care. And then it's too often too late. Uh, it's the same as the problem here where people are, are utilizing emergency rooms. It's, they're sicker, it's more expensive, et cetera. And so I think you know, to talk about health promotion as a part of reducing disparities, you still got to start with universal health care. Joel, you mentioned in an email earlier that we were trading about mm -hmm. this idea of solutions ultimately have to land at the local level, um, yet you can't completely control things from the local level. And how much of this solution can come from the local level? I mean, could we just try to get everyone at the local level to say, OK, we are going to focus on these communities? Or does there need to be some, some thinking at a much higher level which drives that, which ultimately would, would address disparities? Well, I think everybody touched on that in yeah. a certain way. Because if there are no assets at the local level, it's really hard to have people create their solutions. And, and because of that, we need the enablers from higher levels of communities or governments or the private sector to ensure that those assets exist. Uh, certainly, um, you know, we also already heard, even within a community, there are differences depending on where within a zip code uh, people are living. So I was thinking about this in terms of the, the 10, what's called the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. And a lot of them have to do with medical uh, interventions, immunizations, better maternal child health care, family planning. All those are really important. But they're not helpful to communities if there are policies that keep people from accessing those things. So it really has to be a mix and then have the appropriate workers at the local level with, who know the communities to be able to do the interventions there. You know, to, to her point, um, this concept of assets at community level. You know, when we think through what's defining our country right now, so you know, when we see things erupting in Baltimore, um, or we see things erupting in all these different um, towns across our country, a lot of times we're surprised. We're like, oh my gosh, this is happening. We, we didn't think this was happening. What's been happening for a long time is many of these communities have been disenfranchised for so long that they've, lo they've lost hope. Um, and there's such a lack of assets in terms of infrastructure to build on. And so we really have to think through how much this problem genuinely defines our country right now. Because I, not just because I've been working on this, I would literally say that this issue of disparities in equity is the defining issue right now of our country. It comes up in different ways. Um, and I think when I put the health spin on it, I think, well, you know, you know what, what are people dying from in all these communities? They're dying from heart disease. Um, they're dying from diabetes. They're dying from all these other things. So I think genuinely these are the defining issues. And so going back to Joel's point in terms of kind of thinking this through, I think we have no, no stronger imperative right now as a country than to figure out how do we bring assets 
to these communities so that people stop living in, in, in situations where they are literally decades behind the rest of the world and decades behind the rest of the country. And then we won't be so surprised when we um, start to understand a lot of the challenges that they're facing. I think that's so true. And I was glad that Peter mentioned universal coverage as, as part of it and the great Supreme Court decision of yesterday. And the United States certainly propels us along in, in this country, but there are more than 100 other countries around the world that are also have set goals for themselves to achieve uh, universal health coverage. So this, this discussion, there are a lot of things that need to be done kind of at the, at the global level and at the national level to f achieve that and to bring these benefits in an affordable way and with good quality to the citizens of the country. But there are 400 million people around the world right now mm -hmm. who don't have that kind of protection and that kind of coverage. And this last mile question is the, is the critical question. It does, as you were saying, Jewel, have to be dealt with at the local level. And the challenge, one of the challenges is localities are all so different. It's not a cookie cutter solution to these problems. But if, you, if we're de dealing with different solutions for different people, different solutions for different locations, how do we scale it up? so that it has that meaningful impact of bringing in 400 million people into coverage. Could I, could I suggest three things that, sure, sure. that have surfaced from our work that we found, looking at it from the level of the individual, that are obstacles that they face, barriers that they face in, in, a, in obtaining coverage and care that they need. One that, that really stands out is, of course, lack of information. Mm -hmm. And one of our grantees did a, did a survey in India of one cohort that had been in the system, had been hospitalized, so it had to deal with the system. These are poor people. Another co cohort that hadn't, and they were equally ignorant of the, of the health system, their rights, and so forth, even though one had been heavily engaged in the system. So more information about the system, about how to stay healthy, really makes a difference when it's delivered at that lo local uh, individual level. So that's one big barrier that we found looking at it from the individual level. The other, of course, is lack of access, but that can be things like language barriers and, and, and things of that sort that need to be addressed through this problem. So a second barrier is lack of access. But then a, then a third is lack of resources. And what we found is it's not just health-related resources. It's not just out-of-pocket expenses. It's the, the resources that are lost when someone can't make it to the, to the job for a day. So it's lost income, you know, those kinds of resources. So some programs that are emerging are providing poor people in communities, not with health insurance necessarily, micro health insurance, but insurance against lost wages, mm. insurance against lost income. And in fact, in some uh, slum communities that I've visited, that is the most popular product for poor people, more than medical loans or medical insurance itself. But one of the things about this is it, it seems a little bit overwhelming. When you start talking about it, it's driven by zip codes, it's driven by social problems, it's driven by you know, these issues that are a bit untangible, intangible. Peter, you guys, however, have gone into Rwanda, a place that had, as it's known, huge problems, and you have shown incredible results there, shown real, I, it appears from the data that I've seen, changes in the disparities. I'm sure there's some disparities that still remain there. Mm -hmm. um, I think Rwanda can be held up as an example of a place where you can see that that these types of, of interventions do work. Yeah, thanks. So, so Rwanda in uh, 1995, the year after the, the genocide that took the lives of a million people, had a life expectancy of, of 28. The situation was not so different from uh, the Ebola situation, in fact, uh, in West Africa now, where uh, pathogens invaded fragile health systems and, and just destroyed everything. Children were, uh, you know, had a one in four chance of dying before their fifth birthday. Rwanda was the poorest country in the world and the lowest recipient of aid in Africa at that time. 20 years later, we've seen uh, the steepest declines in premature mortality ever recorded in modern human history in Rwanda. Uh, life expectancy is more than doubled. We've seen a, a decline of 80% in under five mortality. And I could go on. And there are lots of reasons for this, but I honestly believe that, that, that first and foremost has been uh, that the country has pushed forward with a real sense of urgency around pushing an equity agenda. And that's exactly what they call it. Uh, and so this notion of a sort of a preferential option for the poor, for the 
last mile communities is something that's actually baked into to policy. Every government leader, a mayor who runs a district, they're like the equivalent of a governor in the United States, has to, when they sign a performance contract with the president every year, actually have an equity agenda where they identify the poorest communities in their region and say, here are the, the three or five things that I'm going to do to improve access to health care, education, infrastructure, business development, whatever it is. Uh, and that's had a dramatic impact. If you think about it, reducing inequality, uh, if your goal is to improve population health, you just do the math, right? You want to eliminate all the zeros, those premature deaths. The smartest thing you can do is target those most in need. And last mile communities can be geographically separated uh, from, from health facilities in the rest of society. Uh, or as, as, as Michael said, it can be because of, uh, uh, because of lack of ability to pay. It be, can be because of social exclusion. And so there needs to be sort of a top-down and bottom-up approach. Um, I think there are some principles, like commitment to an equity agenda, that have to be universal and can apply everywhere. But of course, you have to understand your local context. And within any, every, any given setting, the sort of definition of who those priority families and communities are going to be is different. Can I sit? Yeah. Thank you. So you raise a really important point that also gets to um, how we all answer the question, which is to ask ourselves what our societal values are, especially when you talk about pushing an equity agenda. It's actually a little tricky to sit here, especially coming from Connecticut, where so many people think everybody in Connecticut is healthy. Um, and, and want to compare um, what we deal with in disparities in our state or in our country to some of what we see globally. But part of what we have to ask ourselves is, given the assets that we have in this country, what are we willing to accept with regard to the disparities that we also have here? Because you know, we talk, we, there have been a lot of conversations today about data. And we can be really comfortable if we always look at our aggregate data and say, we're doing pretty well here. But once you, even without getting down to zip codes, just look at differences by race, ethnicity, gender, or age, you can really start to say, maybe there's more we need to think about and do. So that we can not necessarily say our biggest imperative is to leave this country to address inequalities, but to also realize where we need to concentrate more here. And I, I think that's the conversation we need to have more of. So, you know, really, we, we don't need to look far to see in a lot of urban communities where people are living in situations that reflect the global challenges, right? So if you look, going back to some of the Place Matters data, and there's an interesting kind of slide I always use when I teach my students, where if you look at some parts of New Orleans, you know, people are living to 54, 55, um, which is generically around the life expectancy in Haiti. Right? And then um, you look at, if you look in parts of Roxbury, Massachusetts, and you see where people are living to about 57, 58, before you go to Back Bay where they live to around you know, 88 and so forth, and you say, well, 57, 58, well, that's akin to things in Angola where you know, people have been dealing with Frank Civil War. And so what I tell my students a lot to kind of um, have people engage in is a couple of things. Um, I think it's important for us to have a moral imperative to change these things wherever we, ca we, we can, and certainly I think Many times we can get on a plane and go to and deal with issues that are very real in terms of globally. A lot of times we just need to step outside of our hospitals. And a lot of our big hospital systems are located in places that have some of the most staggering statistics literally right outside their door. And I don't mean like right outside their door and up, up the road and around the corner. I mean like you open the door and you look at that community mm -hmm. and you look at the data and you're shocked, right? And so going back to this concept of equity agenda, and if we're going to... Um, 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 very kind of, I'm going to kind of say the concept of keeping it real in terms of what are the challenges we're facing. Again, I'm going to go back to there are a lot of people in urban communities in this country that are living in um, situations that are decades and on, they're basically living in another country. And we walk past them all the time. We see them, we get on the train with them, but they have very different lifestyles. And the other thing I always say to folks is if I told you that, um, you know, to be an African American from West Baltimore, you're going to get charged. Um, four dollars extra for gas compared to another person. People would be outraged. Take to the street, they'd say, no, or say, they'd say milk is going to be twice um, as high for the people living in here versus there. You know, people would be like, nope, we don't stand for that in America. 
but yet we stand for infant mortality rates that are twice that in black communities or even higher in places like Memphis and all these other different urban communities. And we stand for it in a very okay way, right? And so where I would say, going back to your point of this equity agenda, is um, we need to start thinking about how, what the problem really is and the fact that the problem, re a lot of these problems are really here, and then the portion of this that each sector can take on and be genuinely committed, and these be not black, black, black people's problems or Hispanic people's problems or poor people's problems, but true defining American problems, because that's what it's looking like now. I think one of the challenges in all this, I'm really glad that raised the kind of the moral aspect of this and our values and carrying forward our values. One of the challenges for those of us here and, and in this room, I think, is how do we translate that into hard action and, and, and really science-based activities. And I, just one example I, that, that Peter and I were part of earlier this week here at the Ideas Festival relates to data. And uh, Peter, you remember the, the story that was told in a meeting that he and I both participated in by one of our colleagues from Liberia about the disparity in investments on the part of the government in health in different parts of the country. And this was before Ebola. So they, the government was moving forward, making progress. They were trying to raise their, their per capita investment in health from something like $27 per year to $44 per year. But it turns out that the, that the part of the country in which the little boy who was the signal Ebola case appeared, the per capita investment was 76 cents. So data do matter um, as, as we carry out our values. And one of the ideas that came out of that discussion, Peter, I don't know if you want to mm -hmm. say any, anything about it, was to, to develop a set of, of metrics. And we're all tired of having too many measures and indicators, but a set of metrics so that we know that when we're carrying out programs, we're not just helping the near poor, we're, we're helping the very poor. And we need those kinds of, of metrics and data in order to carry that out. And it seems like we need them in the U.S. as well uh, to, to be able to see what's happening in, in those, those zip codes that are, that are being ignored, those zip codes that are um, where you're seeing higher rates of, of poverty, but also just health in, in indicators that are sort of off the charts if you, if you mm -hmm. sort of looked at it in, in Western Europe. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you said it well, Michael, but the, the, the main message here is that, uh, you know, that, that poor and vulnerable families um, are, can be invisible even in the data. They get lost in the data, uh, and I think that's true. You can look at a statistic heading in the right direction, but it's just an aggregate number, and unless you really unpack that, you can miss pockets of a very significant disease burden, suffering, or want, and, and so we need to be smarter about the information uh, that we use and be able to look at it uh, in, in different ways, and so what we talked about in that meeting the other day was, uh, was adding another dimension to, to data that we collect. So you can be tracking coverage of a health service, outcomes of a health service, uh, whatever it is that you want to. But if you could also, it, by however you define your priority last mile groups, uh, the, the, the poor, the ones who are geographically inaccessible, what have you, if you could measure that and then look at your data and stratify it this way, it's a very powerful tool. The government in Liberia is very progressive. You know, They were proud of, of raising their per capita spending to $44, and they thought that was going to lift all boats. They didn't know until they looked that there was this vast disparity. Well, we're going to take some questions from the audience. If anyone has any that they want, we'll give us one second so we get the mics out there. Um, here they come. Uh, we'll start over here. Hi, my name is Katina, and I last year served in the Obama administration. And I recently learned from a uh, a internist in New York City, that New York City, according to this internist, is the most limbless nation in the country. I haven't validated the data, and the context of that conversation is that my mom recently became a lower leg double amputee due to diabetes. While this is not about me, my question to you is personal responsibility and choices. There's a broader conversation about food and exercise and smoking. But in many of these communities, it really does boil down to personal responsibility and choice. So in your public health practice, personal or research, what is the data or how significant is the data 
and folks who just choose to make a poor choice in the presence or the absence of information. Jewel, I would throw that one to you. Um. So many years, a few decades ago, when I decided to go to public health school, it was because I felt that I was failing as a doctor. Because at that point, I thought, my patients have options, they have information, and they can make choices. And I'm failing because they're not getting any better. And taking the time to actually learn how we can fool ourselves about the actual choices people can make when, for example, they have a place to live, but by the time they pay their rent, they don't have enough money to buy food, and the money that they do have takes them to a neighborhood where there's not a place to buy healthy food, and where they otherwise aren't as educated as others. You start to accrue or take a number of hits that are ultimately going to affect you socially and make it a lot harder for you to do the things that it seems it would be so logical for people to do. Garth, do you want to weigh in on that? Oh boy, do I want to weigh in on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I respect the, the way you phrase the question and um, I understand the premise. I do have a lot of challenges um, with how we as a society had tried to ascribe the full extent of personal choices, personal responsibility as a way of sometimes um, dissolving our own responsibility in, in all of this matter. And I'm going to give you my very own personal experience in terms of, and Jewel gave a, a good example. You know, I'm, um, I'm a cardiologist by training, and when I was back in academic medicine, I would have this patient who would repeatedly come in because he keep having his heart attacks, and you know, we'd, we'd put in stents to up the wazoo, and I kept saying, gosh, he's just not making the right choices. Um, and then one time I, wa I saw him outside on the street and I realized that he was actually homeless um, and that we were giving him all the technology. I mean, he was getting the, the left ventricular assist devices. He was getting all the technology we could do. And it, it, you know, we were then saying, oh, he's just not making the right decisions. What we weren't paying attention to was a person attached to the heart. Right, so you know, we were focused on the heart, but the, the everything about that other person um, um, we forgot about. And so that's why I kind of take these things very seriously because I think I was saying to myself, you know what, it's his bad choices and he's not, he's not um, doing a good job. And what we really should have took a step back at and look at what's the framework of what this person's living and what's the life they're living and what are all of the things that are influencing his decisions um, and how he's ending up here in a repeated manner. And so I struggle with the question you say as a clinician, I struggle with it from a public health perspective. And what I do believe now, I've come to believe, is that we as a society need to give people the assets and the capabilities to make the right decisions. And I think once we have adequately done that, we can then more analyze this concept of you know, how much of this is that people just make bad decisions all the time, which I'm not sure I agree with. Let's take another question. Uh, is there anyone else out there? I'm over here, just wait for the mic. Right, keep your hand up so they can find you. Yep, there you go. Great. Hi, I'm Risa Lavizo Mori, and you know one of the things that uh, all of you touched on is how overwhelming some of uh, this can be, and I wonder if one of the reasons it seems overwhelming to us is because uh, we tend to think of the 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 problems as being siloed, when in fact uh, the ability to reduce disparities in education or wealth or health are pretty interconnected. Right. And maybe if we spent uh, more time in place-based strategies trying to connect those solutions, um, we might get a little further. So I just wonder if what you think about that and if you can think of any examples either here or around the world where there's been success in taking that approach. Well. I actually think the problem is not that overwhelming. I think it gets overwhelming when we forget that we all kind of have our own lane and there are things that uh, each person can do in terms of each sector and then kind of creating that cohesive um, uh, roadmap. And so, you know, when I think it gets overwhelming is when one person may try to solve the education, housing, and all the other problems. Uh, but where it gets less overwhelming is when we have 
um, kind of a roadmap for how the education part fits in, as well as kind of all of these different spheres. And I think uh, where we are right now is um, um, we need a better health equity agenda for this country, um, where we each define the roles and responsibilities for the private sector, the public sector, individuals, clinicians, and all of the folks that are involved. Peter, do you think, think that's been part I... of... Let me just ask Peter one question on yeah. that. Do, Peter, do you think that that has been part of the success in Rwanda, that it's a relatively small place, and there was fairly, there's fairly strong leadership at the top in the president's office there. Do you think that that has helped in terms of improving uh, health metrics in, 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 in Rwanda? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you can have a you can have a policy, but a policy is just a you know it's just a piece of paper uh, unless there's someone to implement it and hold people accountable for um, for success. And so leadership's absolutely been a key part of uh, of, of Rwanda's success. Um, you know, great leaders don't grow on trees. I think great leaders were cultivated, and something the president of Rwanda did was cultivate a tremendous cadre of leaders in uh, in, in the public sector and in the private sector to call on the diaspora Rwandans who were living all over the world who had been driven out before for the genocide and been educated in the US and in Europe to come back and rebuild the country. Uh, that's been a huge part of it. I think to get, to, um, to get back to, to your question as well, um, we think a lot in the world of the so-called bottom billion about what are called poverty traps. Um, where uh, for families living in real extreme poverty, uh, you know, it's one illness can sort of tip the scales, right? One person gets sick, then the family has catastrophic spending, they lose whatever meager assets they have, then they lose their land, then the kid comes out of school, and then that whole cycle of poverty is perpetuated for another generation. And I think definitely a multi-sectoral approach is a key part of combating that. But sometimes what it takes is a smart investment in the right place to break that cycle. And that might be access to good health care. It might be, in some cases of extreme poverty, cash transfers. I don't know how well that, that model sort of translates to the domestic context, but we've certainly seen success with that. I, I, I agree with Risa. It can seem overwhelming sometimes. And I, in a lot of the countries where we work, I feel like last mile is sometimes the wrong metric. It's more than a mile in order to cover all of those who are, who are in real poverty. But I, I think Risa may have hit on something that's really important about how the solution isn't just in the health sector alone, that we, we need to be looking at at the same time as at education, at communication, at, at, other, at, at other spheres. And really, we, we've done a, some thinking about what it means for a health system for a country to be resilient in health. And what it comes down to is, is to get rid of the silos and really see this as kind of a comprehensive approach to an individual's health care. And in fact, there's, a, there's an interesting story that um, the, the new health minister of Liberia tells about how Liberia was making great progress, they thought, on health, and they were leading other countries in, in Africa in meeting the, the development goals in health and so forth, and, and they were very proud of the, the individual accomplishments. But when Ebola came along, it wiped all of that out, and it, the, the silos fell like dominoes on, on, on the table. You probably played that game with your little kids of stacking up the dime, dominoes and then tipping it over, and that's what happened. And so now they're looking back at okay, we need to make sure our health system is really a system and, and the community health workers and the labs and the hospitals and all that are all connected in the proper way. But to really make it resilient, it needs to be connected to resources from the private sector, resources in communications, resources in supply chain management and so forth to stitch all of that together. Now, it seems overwhelming, but when parties get around the table like that from these various sectors, sectors, then we start see, seeing solutions and durable solutions flowing from it, resilient ones. So I, I have to say, I agree, and I'm not sure we still gave the whole answer, and I'm not going to probably give the rest of the answer, but I would like to add that um, when we talk about not being siloed or everyone having a hand in this um, from public or private sector, that includes people's considering how much they pay individuals. It includes mm -hmm. their hiring practices. It, it includes so much more that determines what actually happens in a person's life every day with the reminder that by the time we fix the healthcare system to be more caring and accessible, somebody already is ill most of the time. And as a primary care doc and public health person who wants to believe in prevention, it means that 
every one of us, no matter what we, we do with all our innovation, can think about how what, how what we're working on can also be health promoting, even if it will never have anything to do with the medical system. And unfortunately, that's somewhat damning of what's happening in our country when you think about the incredible disparities that are evident in the United States today, um, unfortunately. But let's, let's move on to another question. Um, over here. Hi, my name is Nicholas Wu. Uh, I'm an educator by training, and I've been teaching kids in uh, San Francisco and the South Bronx. So my question is, um, a lot of my students come in with, you know, chronic health problems, et cetera, et cetera. They can't study. And, um, and, you know, kind of what you guys are saying is that, you know, this is an issue that can't just be solved within the healthcare system. It has to involve education, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the dialogue and issues within the education world right now is focused on testing, charters, unions, and things like that. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of willpower within the education world to kind of take on, you know, promoting healthy behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from your perspectives, what do you think are um, one to three things that you think schools can do or, you know, something like that that can make a uh, sizable, effective change um, to promote healthy communities? Right, before we do that, question to you as a teacher working in those schools, how much of an impact does the student's health have on things in the classroom? Is it minor? Is it a daily occurrence that you have to deal with something? What, what is it like for you as an educator? Um, how, is, how is the health of your students affecting your ability to teach? Um, it's, it's huge. Um, everything from what you were saying about lack of information. So students would go to the ER for you know, something that's super minor. Um, they would... Um, and then there's nutritional issues. They don't eat breakfast. They skip lunch. Um, then they don't have energy. They fall asleep after lunch. Um, high rates of uh, absenteeism because of um, uh, doctor visits that, for whatever reasons, take up the whole day because you know they have to wait in the, at the clinic all day. Um, parents have to take days off work in order, you know, lost income and, and things like that. Um, so it's a huge, as a huge toll. Um, on the ability as a teacher to not only go through daily lessons, but to make effective, you know, long-term projects. You know, it, it's almost impossible to think of, okay, we're going to work on this for the next month because kids are out in and out all the time. Does anyone want to jump in on uh, his question about what are things that could be done to help with that? Well, you know, I think... It's, it's an interesting cycle because I also think education has a reciprocal link to health in a number of different ways. Um, I know for even for my own life and my own life experiences, once for education, the actual choices I had would have been limited and who knows how that would have affected my own health outcomes. I think there are a number of funders who um, um, speak from a funding perspective. I think we all think we're funding a lot of really good programs in schools and um, you know, I think you know, when you look at even what the Let's Move initiative was attempting to achieve, and, and, and in many ways I think did achieve in trying to bring the discussion around health and nutrition into schools, I think that was effectively done. Um, where I think the bigger challenge is, and it's not just unique to education, it goes back to this kind of multi-sector aspect and how do we create the connectivity is, um, even if there were one-off funding or one-off initiatives that we all do, is how do we create that whole tapestry where all of this makes sense in a lot of different ways to a lot of different people and then is connected to different things. And I, again, go back to my thought pattern around this. I don't think that will happen until we all um, kind of own our own silos of effectiveness, um, have this as a priority within those silos, and then be able to kind of make some of that connectivity. So I feel like I'm at home at the dinner table because <laughs> because my son teaches sixth grade in a charter school oh, in Bridgeport, wow. Connecticut. So we talk about these things. And um, so hearing you, first I just wanted to congratulate you if you were at the opening yesterday, um, hearing Eva talk about empathy. Oh, it wasn't Eva, but hearing the, the speaker who talked about empathy because I think it's so important to have to balance what you do to get your children to do okay on an exam when you understand all the rest that they're dealing with and and what their families are dealing with as well. And there are, there are 
examples that I've heard about of community schools where the, the schools are open for so much more than just the education um, of the children, where parents are in, where maybe they're using the school for multiple purposes and not just education, so you have different generations coming in, where perhaps there's also a school-based health center um, associated so that for those children who have an asthma attack or other reasons that they might miss a day or not come back because they had to go to an appointment, they can be cared for there. And those are, those are some of the micro solutions that, that can at least be assistive in, in your school and in schools like what you're dealing with. Let's take another question. Um, let's try right over here, gentleman in the white. Wait, wait for the microphone, she's coming with it. Thanks. Hi, my name's Tim. I'm a physician in a southern uh, city. And one of the questions I have is that I've seen, I've been interested in health disparities, particularly my interest is in colorectal cancer. I'm a gastroenterologist. And one of the things that bothers me is that we see the sort of um, deterioration of public policies with regards to programs. Um, for example, we just, uh, we've just fought and finally got what we had five years ago with regards to um, screening for breast cancer and cervical cancer in populations. I'm wondering, is, are the issues for disparities the same for homogeneous populations? For example, even though Rwanda is poor, you have an all-black population versus subjugated populations. And it doesn't just have to be the US. I can look at, for example, in my research, looking at uh, the Romanis in, in Hungary, where you have sort of similar health disparities, but also the same sort of subjugated and stigmatized population. I'm wondering if we need to look at different tools in that regard. Peter, you want to? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a great uh, and important point. And in, in, in most societies, I think, uh, have intra-societal inequality. And you're exactly right that those disparities can cut across racial lines. Uh, there, uh, there are, at least by some classifications, different ethnic groups in Rwanda, a big part of what happened, obviously, in 1994, and a big part of the response to that. Um, there are high-risk groups. When you talk about um, HIV care and prevention, uh, uh, men who have sex with men and female sex workers in, uh, uh, in East Africa is a huge part of our response. So, so I think that there, there are racial, there are ethnic, there are uh, sort of societal exclusion factors and there are geographic factors that can all cause disparities. And I think we need to understand our local context to be able to, to drive improvement. Michael, do you want to add anything on that? Um, sort of looking at things more from a global perspective and yeah. other countries where? Well, one, one thing I've found in dealing with uh, diverse country, countries with a great diversity, they may be all black, but there are different tribes, there are different languages, all within one country. And uh, you know, Nigeria has something like 150 different languages. Um, Ethiopia, 27 or more different languages and ethnic groups. So the way, one way of, of kind of overcoming this and dealing with the, the differences within these different groups that some countries are trying, and particularly Ethiopia, is to really focus at the community level. And Ethiopia took a brave step, and they said, we're not going to start by building you know, a bright, shiny hospital in the capital. We're really going to focus on the community level, build up our community health worker core, and then build up our, the rest of our system from there. And that, you know, the rest of the world is kind of watching Ethiopia as this grand experiment about whether this, this works or not. But one of the advantages of it, of approaches like this done at the community level, is that you can take into account the diversity of the country. So what you may do in one particular community in one part of the country, one ethnic group, one language group, may not be exactly what you do with another group in another part of the country, but it's still all part of one national health system. So there's some allowances for those diversities, that diversity can, uh, is, is important, and you can still make progress overall even with that, those diverse approaches. Let's take another question. A woman here in the blonde hair. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Brooke Van Rokel, and um, love the conversation and love also the discussion around collaboration and the breakdown of silos or working across silos. And I couldn't help but notice that as we're all sitting here talking about health disparities, that the population that we're speaking of isn't represented here and isn't represented in a lot of these conversations. And I was wondering if any of you have had any experience in bringing people to the table who are affected 
by these disparities and having them involved in the design of solutions and if you have any examples. Could I speak to that, Brooke? Yeah. What Brooke because what, Brooke, is your name right? Um, uh, that's a really, really important point. And um, uh, just as a personal matter, the, w the way, I'm not saying I'm an ex a shining example of anything, but the way I conduct my work is I, I have to sit down and, and would spend time with the people that are most affected by it. That's just, I, I will not move forward with the program without having done that. And, and, and actually, the programs that have the greatest success are ones that are co-designed uh, with the community that they're supposed to help. And there's so much wisdom in those communities, the, the individuals in them, the, the natural leadership that emerges and so forth. And I think it's very, very important to have that perspective. You know, so I've spent time um, you know, just spending days and weeks in slums in different parts of the world just to listen to people, to sit back, be the fly on the wall, listen, and then slowly engage, and learned a lot from that. So I think it, it's terribly, terribly important. So what, what I was saying earlier about approaching these problems, not just from the systems level, the supply side, but also from the so-called demand side, you know, what, where the individual is and trying to meet the individual where they are, to address their particular problems, but also build on their particular assets, I think is the key to success. Uh, of, of a lot of these different approaches. So thanks you, thank you for Jules, you, you run a health department in Connecticut, and I'm sure you try to get out there and listen to these people and hear the, the people who are, you know, at the, the bottom end of this. And yet, from a practical perspective, how do you translate that in, into policy? Because clearly Connecticut hasn't solved all of the world's problems yet. Um, Connecticut <laughs> hasn't solved all Connecticut's problems yeah. yet. Although, we're your working exchange, on although your exchange was a model for right. the rest of the country. Right, so, so talking to people, one of, the, one of the, uh, the wonderful aspects of going from being a doctor, doing one-on-one -on -one patient, to doing what I do now, is that if you were good at talking to patients, hopefully when you talk to communities and larger groups, they still feel like you're a good communicator and listener. So for Connecticut, I, I'm glad to be able to answer because we haven't talked much. We talked about urban disparities. We haven't talked a lot of, in this conversation about disparities in rural communities, which are very isolated and which we don't necessarily see, or on Indian reservations. So to um, Connecticut gives me, I call Connecticut a microcosm of the country, in which we can easily look at the urban problems, but also go to what we call the quiet corner of the state, Wyndham County, which is largely white and not Latino and African American, but in rankings of county health, is always last or next to the last um, alongside New Haven County. So to go there and have people just say, don't forget we're here, and to work with the, the health systems, the public health workers and schools and other community leaders, to know that the solutions that they need might start with transportation, to, to recognize that childhood obesity is just as prevalent there as it is in the urban areas, enables me to go out and tell their story when they feel that they're stuck in the quiet corner of the state. And we've, we've been able to take advantage of some state money, but largely federal money, through the Affordable Care Act, which as we celebrate, I remind people, has a whole component that's devoted to prevention and to crafting solutions for all of this, that um, we're, we're working hard to, to do just that. Another question? Yes, over here. Yeah, you, yep. Hi, my name's Pamela, and my question is maybe a little bit coming from the other direction uh, with respect to Brooke's question, and that is that health disparities and these differential outcomes in health, in the United States at least, are not necessarily linked to poverty. So when you look along racial and ethnic lines, you still see disparities in outcomes. So, you know, with uh, birth outcomes for African-American women, even in the highest SES, you're still gonna see worse outcomes than you see. So part of my question comes a little bit back to the question around values. And I'm also thinking that there was a, there was a piece in the New York Times just a day or so ago 
emphasizing how a lot of with the after the Charleston shootings, emphasizing how so many of the news discussions were around the fact that the U.S. no longer has structural inequalities or structural racism and things like this. So there's a perception that we've moved past that. So my question is, how do you then educate people? How do you actually move our country to a place where people can have different values if we're under the impression that we've actually progressed past these things, and yet you see these outcomes that are quite different regardless of um, socioeconomic status? So that data around women and birth outcomes is not universal across geographies. And if you actually look at that data, I used to quote that a lot, and then somebody called me on it, and it had me actually dig deeper. It's actually pretty much still very much place-based, even though it's not socioeconomic based. And so um, even the concept, you see it in places like New Jersey, um, and that's where a lot of those studies were quoted from, um, and some of those other places where they talk about the fact that African-American women even from higher education still have worse um, health outcomes from um, women, um, non-minority women with lower, and it is true. But what I would say when you look at even them, and when you look at what happened with the back to sleep study in Mississippi that helped to reduce um, infant mortality from the first year and all of those kinds of things is, it is still very much place-based and that place-based initiatives that target culturally relevant activities even across socioeconomic stratas um, are effective. And so I just want to make that point because I think sometimes we think those, when we quote some of this data, it's universal um, when truthfully a lot of this thing and Risa used the right terminology about these are very much place-based challenges with place-based solutions. But does that educate me a little bit on that? It did seem to me that some cancers, you're getting much higher rates among African Americans, yep. um, diabetes, and, and Sure, yeah, so, 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 so here's where we, it's kind of like a little bit of apples and oranges. The data she was articulating was this concept of whether when you control for socioeconomic status, um, does it reduce disparities? And the concept of whether in African American women who come from a higher socioeconomic status, they have worse health, uh, infant mortality rate is still higher than for non-African American women who haven't graduated high school. And that part is true. Now when you look at some of the other data that you're articulating in terms of looking at um, you know, colorectal cancer outcomes, which is you know, abysmal in African American men across the board, a lot of that, and you see even similar outcomes for colorectal cancer for poor um, Caucasian uh, white men as well, even though the, the, lethal, the, 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 the lethality of it in black communities is still way higher. Um, a lot of that still is lived in the poverty of colorectal cancer, of cancer, where no one should really have that because you know, if you get your colonoscopy at, you know, at you know, 10 years, it takes 10 years for a polyp to grow into cancer. So that's kind of a perfect target of a cancer. And so when I say this is that that activity looks a little bit about this issue of, you know, is it, does socioeconomic status not matter? And I would say that is potentially true, but play still does matter. And I would say when you look at some of these national disparities, not the numbers, there is a heavy component of being poor that, that relates to that. And again, still this very co heavy concept of, you know, where you live matters. And it's, you can't get away from that. Uh, so the first session I went to this morning was talking about the human genome. People, people I think, are going to have a hard time going but so far in um, attributing cause or finding solutions for um, health disparities if they think of them medically, if they don't find some other biological links um, that they can say there's some science behind this as well. And there's an, this evolving um, research on not just the gene, but the outside of the gene, epigenetics, and whether or not changes um, related to stress, environment, uh, nutrition, also do something um, to the outside of a person's gene that um, influences the way it reacts and then um, other diseases are manifest, diabetes, hypertension. There's a, a wide open field there that I think we need to go to uh, because for those who are challenged to tackle the social issues and some of the things we didn't talk about today that have been talked about in the past week like racism, um, there's, there's a, a lot of scientific research that we probably still need to understand to also address the issue going forward. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I think that's a pretty good place to end, however. I took the um, last word. <laughs> uh, it was a good word. It and, was a and I mean, it does, it also you just gets at how big an issue this is, that it's, it's a huge issue, it's multifactorial, um, but it's good to have these conversations and to really think about it, and, and, and I think that that's a, 
you know, a really great way to, um, to, to end on. Thank you all for coming, um, and enjoy the rest of the conference.